So this Smerdyakov became Fyodor Pavlovich's second servant, and was living in the lodge with Grigory and Marfa at the time our story begins. He was employed as cook. I ought to say something of this Smerdyakov, but I am ashamed of keeping my reader's attention so long occupied with these common menials, and I will go back to my story, hoping to say more of Smer Chapter I. A. The confession of a passionate heart in verse Alyosha remained for some time irresolute after hearing the command his father shouted to him from the carriage. But in spite of his uneasiness he did not stand still. That was not his way. He went at once to the kitchen to find out what his father had been doing above. Then he set off, trusting that on the way he would find some answer to the doubt tormenting him. I hasten to add that his father's shouts, commanding him to return home with his mattress and pillow, did not frighten him in the least. He understood perfectly that those peremptory shouts were merely a flourish to produce an effect. In the same way a tradesman in our town who was celebrating his name day with a party of friends, getting angry at being refused more vodka, smashed up his own crockery and furniture. Next day, of course, when he was sober, he regretted the broken cups and saucers. Alyosha knew that his father would let him go back to the monastery next day, possibly even that evening. Moreover, he was fully persuaded that his father might hurt anyone else, but would not hurt him. Alyosha was certain that no one in the whole world ever would want to hurt him, and what is more, he knew that no one could hurt him. This was for him an action, assumed once for all without question, and he went his way without hesitation, relying on it. But at that moment an anxiety of a different sort disturbed him, and worried him the more because he could not formulate it. It was the fear of a woman, of Katerina Ivanovna, who had so urgently entreated him in the note handed to him by Madame Holikov to come and see her about something. This request and the necessity of going had at once aroused an uneasy feeling in his heart, and this feeling had grown more and more painful all the morning in spite of the scenes at the hermitage and at the father's. He was not uneasy because he did not know what she would speak of and what he must answer and he was not afraid of her simply as a woman. Though he knew little of women, he had spent his life, from early childhood till he entered the monastery, entirely with women. He was afraid of that woman, Katerina Ivanovna. He had been afraid of her from the first time he saw her. He had only seen her two or three times, and had only chanced to say a few words to her. He thought of her as a beautiful, proud, imperious girl. It was not her beauty which troubled him, but something else. And the vagueness of his apprehension increased the apprehension itself. The girl's aims were of the noblest. He knew that. She was trying to save his brother Dmitri simply through generosity, though he had already behaved badly to her. Yet, although Alyosha recognized and did justice to all these fine and generous sentiments, a shiver began to run down his back as soon as he drew near her house. He reflected that he would not find Ivan, who was so intimate a friend, with her, for Ivan was certainly now with his father. Dmitri he was even more certain not to find there, and he had a foreboding of the reason, and so his conversation would be with her alone. He had a great longing to run and see his brother Dmitri before that fateful interview. Without showing him the letter, he could talk to him about it, but Dmitri lived a long way off, and he was sure to be away from home too. Standing still for a minute, he reached a final decision. Crossing himself with a rapid and accustomed gesture, and at once smiling, he turned resolutely in the direction of his terrible lady. He knew her house. If he went by the high street and then across the marketplace, it was a long way round. Though our town is small, it is scattered, and the houses are far apart. And meanwhile his father was expecting him, and perhaps had not yet forgotten his command. He might be unreasonable, and so he had to make haste to get there and back. So he decided to take a short cut by the back way, for he knew every inch of the ground. This meant skirting fences, climbing over hurdles, and crossing other people's backyards, where everyone he met knew him and greeted him. In this way he could reach the high street in half the time. 
He had to pass the garden adjoining his father's and belonging to a little tumble-down house with four windows. The owner of this house, as Alyosha knew, was a bedridden old woman, living with her daughter, who had been a genteel maid servant in general's families in Petersburg. Now she had been at home a year, looking after her sick mother. She always dressed up in fine clothes, though her old mother and she had sunk into such poverty that they went every day to Fyodor Pavlovich's kitchen for soup and bread, which Marfa gave readily. Yet, though the young woman came up for soup, she had never sold any of her dresses, and one of these even had a long train of fact which Alyosha had learned from Rakitin. He had forgotten it as soon as he heard it, but now, reaching the garden, he remembered the dress with the train, raised his head, which had been bowed in thought, and came upon something quite unexpected. Over the hurdle in the garden, Dmitri, mounted on something, was leaning forward, gesticulating violently, beckoning to him, obviously afraid to utter a word. Alyosha ran up to the hurdle. It's a good thing you looked up. I was nearly shouting to you, Mitty said in a joyful, hurried whisper. Climb in here quickly, how splendid that you've come. I was just thinking of you, Alyosha was delighted too, but he did not know how to get over the hurdle. Mitty put his powerful hand under his elbow to help him jump, tucking up his cassock. Alyosha leaped over the hurdle with the agility of a bare-legged street urchin. Well done. Now come along, said Mitya in an enthusiastic whisper. Where, whispered Alyosha, looking about him and finding himself in a deserted garden with no one near but themselves. The garden was small, but the house was at least fifty paces away. There's no one here. Why do you whisper? asked Alyosha. Why do I whisper? Deuce take it, cried Mitre at the top of his voice. You see what silly tricks nature plays one. I am here in secret, and on the watch. I'll explain later on, but knowing it's a secret, I began whispering like a fool, when there's no need. Let us go. Over there. Till then be quiet. I want to kiss you. Glory to God in the world. Glory to God in me. Glory? I was just repeating that sitting here before you came. The garden was about three acres in extent, and planted with trees only along the fence at the four sides. There were apple trees, maples, limes, and birch trees. The middle of the garden was an empty grass space, from which several hundred weight of hay was carried in the summer. The garden was let out for a few rubbles for the summer. There were also plantations of raspberries and currants and gooseberries laid out along the sides. A kitchen garden had been planted lately near the house. Dmitri led his brother to the most secluded corner of the garden. There, in a thicket of lime trees and old bushes of black currant, elder, snowball tree, and lilac, there stood a tumble-down green summer house, blackened with its walls were of lattice work, but there was still a roof which could give shelter. God knows when this summer house was built. There was a tradition that it had been put up some fifty years before by a retired colonel called von Schmidt, who owned the house at that time. It was all in decay, the floor was rotting, the planks were loose, the woodwork smelled musty. In the summer house there was a green wooden table fixed in the ground, and round it were some green benches upon which it was still possible to sit. Alyosha had at once observed his brother's accelerated condition and on entering the arbor he saw half a bottle of brandy and a wine-glass on the table. That's brandy, Mitya laughed. I see your look. He's drinking again. Distrust the apparition. Distrust the worthless, lying crowd, and lay aside thy doubts. I'm not drinking. I'm only indulging, as that pig, your racketin, says. He'll be a civil counselor one day but he'll always talk about indulging. Sit down. I could take you in my arms, Alyosha, and press you to my bosom till I crush you, for in the whole world, in reality, in real IT, can you take it in? I love no one but you. No one but you and one jade I have fallen in love with, to my ruin. 
but being in love doesn't mean loving. You may be in love with a woman and yet hate her. Remember that, I can talk about it gaily still. Sit down here by the table and I'll sit beside you and look at you and go on talking. You shall keep quiet and I'll go on talking, for the time has come. But on reflection, you know, I'd better speak quietly, for here, here you can never tell what ears are listening. I will explain everything. As they say, the story will be continued. Why have I been longing for you? Why have I been thirsting for you all these days and just now? Have you ever felt? Have you ever dreamt of falling down a precipice into a pit? That's just how I'm falling, but not in a dream. And I'm not afraid, and don't you be afraid. At least, I am afraid, but I enjoy it. It's not enjoyment, though, but ecstasy. Damn it, or whatever it is, a strong spirit, a weak spirit, a womanish spirit, whatever it is, let us praise nature. You see what sunshine, how clear the sky is, to send an angle. I might have sent any one, but I wanted to send an angle. And here you are on your way to see father and her. Did you really mean to send me? cried Alyosha with a distressed expression. Stay, you knew it, and I see you understand it all at once. But be quiet, be quiet for a time. Don't be sorry, and don't cry. Dmitri stood up, thought a moment, and put his finger to his forehead. She's asked you, written to you a letter or something. That's why you were going to her. You wouldn't be going except for that. Here is her note. Alyosha took it out of his pocket. Mitya looked through it quickly. And you were going the back way? Oh, gods, a thank you for sending him by the back way. And he came to me like the golden fish to the silly old fisherman in the fable. Listen, Ail an angle in heaven I've told already. But I want to tell an angle on earth. You are an angle on earth. You will hear and judge and forgive. And that's what I need, that someone above me should forgive. Listen. If two people break away from everything on earth and fly off into the unknown, or at least one of them, and before flying off or going to ruin he comes to someone else, make haste. Ham, don't be in a hurry, Alyosha. You hurry and worry yourself. There's no need to hurry now. Now the world has taken a new turning. Alyosha, what a pity you can't understand ecstasy. But what am I saying to him? as though you didn't understand it. What an ass I am! What am I saying? Be noble, man, who says that? Alyosha made up his mind to wait. He felt that perhaps, indeed, his work lay here. Mitya sank into thought for a moment, with his elbow on the table and his head in his hand. Both were silent. Alyosha, said Mitya, you are the only one who won't laugh. I should like to begin my confession with skillers him to joy, and die freed. I don't know German. I only know it's called that. Don't think I'm talking nonsense because I'm drunk. I'm not a bit drunk. Brandy's all very well, but I need two bottles to make me drunk. Silenus with his rosy fizz upon his stumbling ass. But I've not drunk a quarter of a bottle, and I'm not Silenus. I'm not Silenus, though I am strong one, for I've made a decision once for all. Forgive me the pun. You will have to forgive me a lot more than puns today. Don't be uneasy. I'm not spinning it out. I'm talking sense, and I'll come to the point in a minute. I won't keep you in suspense. Stay, how does it go? He raised his head, thought a minute, and began with enthusiasm. Wild and fearful in his cavern hid the naked troglodyte, and the home menacing with spear and a row in the woods the hunter strayed, woo to all poor wretches stranded on those cruel and hostile shores, from the peak of high Olympus came the mother seers down, seeking in those savage regions her lost daughter Proserpine. But the goddess found no refuge, found no kindly welcome there, and no temple bearing witness to the worship of the gods. From the fields and from the vineyards came no fruits to deck the feasts, only flesh of blood-stained victims smoldered on the altar fires, 
and where the grieving goddess turns her melancholy gaze. My dear, my dear, in degradation, in degradation now, too. There is a terrible amount of suffering for man on earth, a terrible lot of trouble. Don't think I'm only a brute in an officer's uniform, wallowing in dirt and drink. I hardly think of anything but of that degraded man, if only I'm not lying. I pray God I'm not lying and showing off. I think about that man because I am that man myself. Would he purge his soul from vileness and attain to light and worth? He must turn and cling forever to his ancient Mother Earth. But the difficulty is how am I to cling forever to Mother Earth? I don't kiss her. I don't cleave to her bosom. Am I to become a peasant or a shepherd? I go on and I don't know whether I'm going to shame or to light and joy. That's the trouble, for everything in the world is a riddle, and whenever I've happened to sink into the vilest degradation, and it's always been happening, I always read that poem about sea. Has it reformed me? Never, for I'm a karamazov. For when I do leap into the pit, I go headlong with my heels up and am pleased to be falling in that degrading attitude, and pride myself upon it. And in the very depths of that degradation I begin a hymn of praise. Let me be accursed. Let me be vile and base. Only let me kiss the hem of the veil in which my God is shrouded. Though I may be following the devil, I am thy son, O Lord, and I love thee, and I feel the joy without which the world cannot stand. Joy everlasting fostereth the soul of all creation. It is her secret ferment fires the cup of life with flame. Tis at her beck the grass hath turned each blade towards the light, and solar systems have evolved from chaos and dark night, filling the realms of boundless space beyond the sage sight. At bounteous nature's kindly breast, all things that breathe drink joy, and birds and beasts and creeping things all follow where she leads. Her gifts to man are friends in need, the reef, the foaming must, to angles vision of God's throne, to insects sensual lust. But enough poetry. I am in tears. Let me cry. It may be foolishness that every one would laugh at. But you won't laugh. Your eyes are shining, too. Enough poetry. I want to tell you now about the insects to whom God gave sensual lust to insects sensual lust. I am that insect, brother, and it is said of me specially. All we Karamazovs are such insects, and, angle as you are, that insect lives in you, too, and will stir up a tempest in your blood. Tempests, because sensual lust is a tempest worse than a tempest. Beauty is a terrible and awful thing. It is terrible because it has not been fathomed and never can be fathomed. Here the boundaries meet, and all contradictions exist side by side. I am not a cultivated man, brother, but I've thought a lot about this. It's terrible what mysteries there are. Too many riddles weigh men down on earth. We must solve them as we can, and try to keep a dry skin in the water. Beauty, I can't endure the thought that a man of lofty mind and heart begins with the ideal of the Madonna, and ends with the ideal of Sodom. What's still more awful is that a man with the ideal of Sodom in his soul does not renounce the ideal of the Madonna, and his heart may be on fire with that ideal, genuinely on fire. Just, yes, man is broad to broad, indeed. I'd have him narrower. The devil only knows what to make of it. What to the mind is shameful is beauty and nothing else to the heart. Is there beauty in Sodom? Believe me, that for the immense mass of Mankin beauty is found in Sodom. Did you know that secret? The awful thing is that beauty is mysterious as well as terrible. God and the devil are fighting there, and the battlefield is the heart of man. But a man always talks of his own action. Listen, now to come to facts. Chapter If The Confession of a Passionate Heart In anecdote I was leading a wild life then. Father said just now that I spent several thousand rubles in seducing young girls. That's a swinish invention, and there was nothing of the sort. And if there was, I didn't need money simply for that. With me money is an accessory, the overflow of my heart, the framework. 
Today she would be my lady, tomorrow a wench out of the streets in her place. I entertained them both. I threw away money by the handful on music, rioting, and gypsies. Sometimes I gave it to the ladies, too, for they'll take it greedily, that must be admitted, and be pleased and thankful for it. Ladies used to be fond of me, not all of them, but it happened, it happened. But I always liked side paths, little dark back alleys behind the main road there one finds adventures and surprises, and precious metal in the dirt. I am speaking figuratively. Brother, in the town I was in, there were no such back alleys in the literal sense, but morally there were. If you were like me you'd know what that means. I loved vice. I loved the ignominy of vice. I loved cruelty. Am I not a bug? Am I not a noxious insect? In fact, a karamazov. Once we went. A whole lot of us. It was dark, it was winter, and I began squeezing a girl's hand and forced her to kiss me. She was the daughter of an official. A sweet, gentle, submissive creature. She allowed me, she allowed me much in the dark. She thought, poor thing, that I should come next day to make her an offer. I was looked upon as a good match, too. But I didn't say a word to her for five months. I used to see her in a corner at dances. We were always having dances, her eyes watching me. I saw how they glowed with fire, a fire of gentle indignation. This game only tickled that insect lust I cherished in my soul. Five months later she married an official and left the town, still angry, and still, perhaps, in love with me. Now they live happily. Observe that I told no one. I didn't boast of it. Though I'm full of low desires, and love what's low, I'm not dishonorable. You were blushing. Your eyes flashed. Enough of this filth with you. And all this was nothing much wayside blossoms a la Paul de Kock though the cruel insect had already grown strong in my soul. I've a perfect album of reminiscences, brother. God bless them, the darlings. I tried to break it off without quarreling, and I never gave them away. I never bragged of one of them. But that's enough. You can't suppose I brought you here simply to talk of such nonsense. No, I'm going to tell you something more curious. And don't be surprised that I'm glad to tell you, instead of being ashamed. You say that because I blushed, Elio, I wasn't blushing at what you were saying or at what you've done. I blushed because I am the same as you are. You come, that's going a little too far. No, it's not too far, said Alyosha warmly. Obviously, the idea was not a new one. The latter's the same. I'm at the bottom step, and you were above somewhere about the thirteenth. That's how I see it. But it's all the same. Absolutely the same in kind. Any one on the bottom step is bound to go up to the top one. Then one ought not to step on at all. Any one who can help it had better not. But can you? I think that Rogue Rushenka has an eye for men. She told me once that she'd devour you one day. There, there, I want from this field of corruption fouled by flies, let's pass to my tragedy, also befouled by flies, that is by every sort of violence. Although the old man told lies about my seducing innocence, there really was something of the sort in my tragedy, though it was only once, and then it did not come off. The old man who has reproached me with what never happened does not even know of this fact. I never told any one about it. You were the first, except Ivan, of course. Ivan knows everything. He knew about it long before you. But Ivan's a Tom. Ivan's a Tom, yes. Alyosha listened with great attention. I was lieutenant in a line regiment, but still I was under supervision, like a kind of convict. Yet I was awfully well received in the little town. I spent money right and left. I was thought to be rich. I thought so myself, but I must have pleased them in other ways as well. Although they shook their heads over me, they liked me. My colonel, who was an old man, took a sudden dislike to me. 
He was always down upon me, but I had powerful friends. And, moreover, all the town was on my side, so he couldn't do me much harm. I was in fault myself for refusing to treat him with proper respect. I was proud. This obstinate old fellow, who was really a very good sort, kind-hearted and hospitable, had had two wives, both dead. His first wife, who was of a humble family, left a daughter as unpretentious as herself. She was a young woman of four and twenty when I was there, and was living with her father and an aunt, her mother's sister. The aunt was simple and illiterate. The niece was simple but lively. I like to say nice things about people. I never knew a woman of more charming character than Agafia Fancy. Her name was Agafia Ivanovna, and she wasn't bad-looking either, in the Russian style. Tall, stout. She had not married, although she had had two suitors. She refused them, but was as cheerful as ever. I was intimate with her, not in that way. It was pure friendship. I have often been friendly with women quite innocently. I used to talk to her with shocking frankness, and she only laughed. Many women like such freedom, and she was a girl too, which made it very amusing. Another thing, one could never think of her as a young lady. She and her aunt lived in her father's house with a sort of voluntary humility, not putting themselves on an equality with other people. She was a general favorite, and of use to every one, for she was a clever dressmaker. She had a talent for it. She gave her services freely without asking for payment, but if any one offered her payment, she didn't refuse. The colonel, of course, was a very different matter. He was one of the chief personages in the district. He kept open house, entertained the whole town, gave suppers and dances. At the time I arrived and joined the battalion, all the town was talking of the expected return of the colonel's second daughter, a great beauty, who had just left a fashionable school in the capital. This second daughter is Katerina Ivanovna, and she was the child of the second wife, who belonged to a distinguished general's family. Although, as I learnt on good, she had connections, and that was all. There may have been expectations, but they had come to nothing. Yet, when the young lady came from boarding school on a visit, the whole town revived. Our most distinguished ladies, two excellencies, and a colonel's wife, and all the rest following their lead, at once took her up and gave entertainments in her honor. She was the belle of the balls and picnics, and they got up tableaux vivants in aid of distressed governesses. I took no notice. I went on as wildly as before, and one of my exploits at the time set all the town talking. I saw her eyes taking my measure one evening at the battery commander's, but I didn't go up to her, as though I disdained her acquaintance. I did go up and speak to her at an evening party not long after. She scarcely looked at me and compressed her lips scornfully. Wait a bit. I'll have my revenge, thought I. I behaved like an awful fool on many occasions at that time, and I was conscious of it myself. What made it worse was that I felt that Kitenko was not an innocent boarding school miss, but a person of character, proud and really high principled. Above all, she had... You think I meant to make her an offer? No, I simply wanted to revenge myself, because I was such a hero and she didn't seem to feel it. Meanwhile, I spent my time in drink and riot, till the lieutenant colonel put me under arrest for three days. Just at that time father sent me six thousand rubles in return for my sending him a deed giving up all claims upon him settling our accounts, so to speak, and saying that I wouldn't expect anything. I didn't understand a word of it at the time. Until I came here, Alyosha, till the last few days, indeed perhaps even now, I haven't been able to make head or tail of my money affairs with father. But never mind that. We'll talk of it later. Just as I received the money, I got a letter from a friend telling me something that interested me immensely. The authorities, I learnt, were dissatisfied with our lieutenant colonel. He was suspected of irregularities. In fact, his enemies were preparing a surprise for him. And then the commander of the division arrived, 
and kicked up the devil of a shindy. Shortly afterwards, he was ordered to retire. I won't tell you how it all happened. He had enemies, certainly. Suddenly there was a marked coolness in the town towards him and all his family. His friends all turned their backs on him.